It has a 7.6 litre Chevrolet engine, produces more than 600 horsepower and uses 30 litres of methanol to travel a single kilometre. It's also Phil Woodman's pride and joy. That car there is the fastest car in Newcastle. It's quite a thrill to um, drive such a car with all that horsepower and um, survive. That sort of attitude will be rife at Broadmeadow this weekend at the Newcastle Street Machine Show. More than 80 entries have made this year's event the biggest yet and organisers are making a suitably big noise about it. But raw power won't be enough to win the judges' praise. Basically it all comes down to uh, uh, a car being highly detailed, that's what they look for. Uh, also the safety factor of the vehicle. Um, and uh, the originality of the vehicle, really. The winners could well be the ones who use the most elbow grease. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. Throsby Creek has long been one of the city's eyesores. While it performs an important job in draining much of the region's stormwater, on low tide it's muddy and smelly. A clean-up was held this year to remove a huge amount of rubbish which had found its way into the creek. Today it was confirmed that tenders will be let to dredge and clean up the channel further. It is, is covered in the budget and there's an amount of money between $1.2 $1.6 million uh, is going to be made available. There's a few contingency items to look at, but uh, yes, it will be in the budget and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Throsby Creek has been the subject of a catchment management study which made a list of expensive recommendations. Keegan says the state government is committed to getting it right and that this money will not be a one-off grant. I believe that the, uh, the government is dedicated to cleaning this waterway up and I expect to get more money later in the year and I expect to see it as a budget item each year till we've got it right. When the property was bought off the federal government earlier this year by Sydney businessman Frank Kalick, residents were outraged. They wanted the building demolished and the land to revert to open space to join neighbouring Apex Park. Their idea was supported by Port Stephens Council, who rezoned the land to prevent virtually any development. Two weeks ago, Council placed a demolition order on the property and asked Mr Kalick to provide reasons why the building should not be demolished. His response was to lodge a development application seeking to refurbish the house and turn it into holiday accommodation. Although the proposal is within zoning guidelines, Councillor Innes Crichton believes Council will not view the idea favourably. The man knew before he purchased it that there were difficulties with the site. He knew that it would only be subject to council consent to anything that could happen here. He should have known that he couldn't live in the house and he certainly should have known that there was very, very strong local opposition. Mr Kalick claims council's stand on the matter is a transparent attempt to deprive him of ownership and says he will not revert the land to open space just to satisfy a group of protesting residents. So we are going to continue to fight it and I think he must be aware of that. We are just not going to give in easily. We realise the gentleman's bought it. We just don't understand why he went into it. Mr Kalick says he's well aware Council will probably knock back the development application, making it difficult for anything to be done with the land. However, he says he's willing to take the matter to the Land and Environment Court to ensure his right of ownership. Jody McKay for MBN News. The Auditorium of West Leagues Club was overflowing with Newcastle's first major prayer breakfast congregation. Religious, business and political leaders joined together remembering the devastation of December 28 last year.
controversy during the week that the meeting was a political gesture promoting the Lord Mayor John McNaughton was simply shrugged off. We live in a secular society, they make those comments. Good that they can make them. In an emotion-charged atmosphere, the speakers called for spiritual protection from an earthquake aftershock. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Eric Arnold's indoor swimming centre at the junction has been the focal point of many a champion of the past and present, but for the past few months it has been idle due to substantial damage suffered in the quake. Today a very pleased Eric Arnold welcomed back his BHP Hunter Club and the public to a brand new pool. After the earthquake we were losing 100,000 litres a day, so it was a non-existent uh, operation. This is the most modern uh, pool that's available in Australia. BHP Hunter swimmers have been spread all over Australia in quest of continued training and given the difficulties they have experienced, last week's third place in the New South Wales Winter Swimming Championships was a marvellous effort. We were down 50% of our team and it was a great effort. Uh, after the first day of the trials we were leading, but I think we ran into a little bit of a hurdle in the second day. But outside of the club swimmers, it's the general public who can benefit greatly now that the junction pool is back in business. They get, a, they get a pretty good deal here and uh, you know the way people are going these days that, uh, and swimming is one of the sports that keep you super fit. The trick is to herd the sheep around a short course through some gates and then up a ramp. Easier said than done. Forty dogs were worked today coming in for the trials from throughout New South Wales. The Kelpies and Border Collies are under strict instructions from their owners. Patience and persistence, the greatest virtues. Top dogs are worth up to $5,000. On the farm there's no doubt who is man's best friend. The Nelson Bay Marlins in blue and gold opened the better with their forward line in control through Heath Hogan and Peter Burke. Burke kicked eight goals last weekend and he was on target once again today. At quarter time the Bay led by nine points but Walls End fought back in the second term to lead by 16 points at the long break. With the breeze picking up Nelson Bay added 4-2 in the third term and held Walls End scoreless. But the champions Walls End couldn't repeat their Houdini acts of last year and Nelson Bay were able to hang on for a fine nine point win, 8-9-57 to Walls End's 7-6-48. The Bay will now play Warners Bay in next week's grand final. At the number two sports ground the Newcastle Rugby Union finals got underway with Maitland in black tackling the powerful university side in the minor semi-final. Uni, grand finalist last year were the favourites but it was Maitland who ran in the first try and it was Rod Carroll who crossed for the blacks and they were looking good. However, Uni hit back from a quick tap taken from a penalty which was awarded on the other side of the paddock and Graham Gill got the pass, stretched out and scored. In the end, Uni ran away with a match to win 23-10. In other grades, Singleton beat Wanderers 7-3 in seconds and Merriweather Carlton defeated Mayfield East in thirds and fourths, 13-9 and 19-13 respectively.
Novocastrians turned out in their hundreds to join the colourful festival, which culminated late this afternoon in a spectacular multinational procession. Local ethnic groups, including Tongans, Greeks, Spaniards and Germans, built elaborate floats, capturing the spirit of their homelands with national dress, music and dance. The event was an overwhelming success, a fitting celebration of Australia's multicultural community and of Hamilton's post-earthquake recovery. The peaceful surroundings of the Shortland Wetland Centre were a fitting location for the launch of the state's school environmental program. The Department of Education hopes to increase students' awareness of global issues and it's produced a comprehensive teaching guide for schools. Environment education has three basic aims. It aims to help people to learn about the environment, to develop skills in investigating the environment and to acquire a concern about the environment. It is mandatory. It is relevant to all parts of our school curriculum. Several teachers have taken a special interest in the Hunter region. They've produced a resource book called The Ark, specifically for schools in the Hunter. Year one students from the Shortland Public School seem already to have grasped the spirit of the environmentally aware 1990s. Lake Macquarie City Council is also promoting environmental awareness in schools with an emphasis on pollution and recycling. Garden Suburb Public School is one of 12 primary schools that will be visited this week by council officers who will give talks on conservation. They will also present children with a project booklet to guide them through an investigation of pollution in their own school. It has been a hectic month for 49-year-old Edith. After visiting relatives in England where her mother died, she was on her way home when her British Airlines flight was stranded in Kuwait the day of the invasion. The next anyone saw of her was when she was forced to appear in one of Saddam Hussein's now infamous videos. By the way, I don't know if I'll be home for my 50th, but if I am, by G, we'll have a party. Back in London on yesterday's Iraqi Airlines flight, she returned to Heathrow to an emotional reunion with her four daughters arriving from Adelaide. Marion, Lindley, Gaylene and Caroline had feared they'd never see their mother again. We heard nothing. You know, things would sneak through, but we never ever give up. There were tears and more hugs. The family that for the past month have been so far apart now could not possibly be closer. Washington, the last stop for the Iraqi Airways Freedom Flight. On board, 47 Americans and two Canadians. It was a bittersweet homecoming, as their thoughts were with those who couldn't make it home. That's my big concern, they're my best friends. It's two of the fellas I went over with. In the welcoming party, someone who was unwelcome, the Iraqi ambassador to Washington. While I came to welcome our guest here, we have taken uh, every step to make their trip comfortable. I'd like to say that the ambassador from Iraq is dead wrong. I wasn't a guest, I damn near starved to death. 76 year old Lloyd Culbertson was one of 11 men freed on medical grounds. Evidence of Baghdad's compassion, according to the ambassador. We made an exception by permitting the sick men to come in. What would it take for everybody to get out? When America give a guarantee, they are not going to strike us. This woman said there were real fears in Baghdad of an American invasion. I mean, the feeling was like all the guns in the world were pointed at your head, you know? But surprisingly, she took Saddam Hussein's line, that the hostages were keeping the peace. And for that, she was proud of a contribution. Did I mind being a human shield? No, I think that's rather a noble thing to be. I really do think that the foreigners there stopped the bombing.
Iraq's message had also rubbed off on the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who escorted the hostages home. Diplomacy must work to seek a political solution. The only diplomacy on George Bush's mind at the moment is next week's summit meeting in Helsinki with Mikhail Gorbachev. Bush wants to clinch a deal with the Soviet leader on a joint superpower approach to the crisis, to send a signal to Saddam Hussein that there'll be no easy way out. Following a welcome to the city by the Lord Mayor and an official opening last night by Member for Shortland, Peter Morris, today the best minds in the world got down to business. 150 oncologists are looking at ways of making the body more efficient at fighting cancer, particularly melanoma, the skin cancer so prevalent here. Doctors have found chemotherapy inefficient at treating the disease and even harmful to our inbuilt immune systems. The idea now is to make that faculty more highly tuned against cancer. One might use the tumor uh, modified in certain ways to vaccinate the patient. Uh, one can also take the patient's own white blood cells, take them out of the body and rev them up so that they react more strongly. So there are a whole variety of approaches that are being taken here and we're coming together to find out uh, the state of the art. Don't be fooled that melanoma can be cured by surgical removal of the malignant mole. If not attended to early, it could spread to other vital internal organs. The immunological therapy has been used generally in late stage tumors, but I think it could come in very early, right after the primary surgery is, is performed, to prevent the tumor from coming back again. Because at the t after the surgery, there's still microscopic seeds of tumor left in the body. And if the body immune defenses can be uh, activated at that point, it may root out the tumor and kill it. The melanoma conference in Newcastle could not have come at a more significant time, with the days getting warmer and soon beaches such as Newcastle will be crowded with people flocking to absorb too much of what we now know to be the dangerous rays of the sun. If you have to go out in the sun, don't do it with the idea of, of, of exposing yourself to the point of burning. Go out to have fun in the sun, but use sunblock, cover up, uh, just be sensible about it. We all know about exam room pressure, but the weeks of waiting for results can be even more nerve-wracking. In what's believed to be a world first, 50 Newcastle apprentices sat for an exam today using pen lights to answer multi-choice questions in barcode. It's like the barcoding used in supermarkets. The information is passed direct into a central computer and immediately processed. 
Developed by the Newcastle University, New Tech Computers and the Hunter Technology Centre, the system saves teachers valuable marking time and the students have the results in minutes. What do you think about getting your results so quickly? Oh, it's good. It keeps you from the suspense. You get it very, very quickly and so all you have to is now and you can go down and look for a job straight away. The government is so impressed it has invested $90,000 to fine-tune the system. The developers say it will revolutionise examinations, opening worldwide markets. Fine weather and fast greens made for a tight but fair final at the Walls End Bowling Club. Earlier in the day, local bowler Kel Pitt failed to take advantage of a home green and allowed Cardiff's Frank Rice a place in the final. He met Woi Woi's Doug Broughton, who had beaten Charlestown's Greg Haig to claim his spot in the decider. Broughton skipped to an early lead and from then on continued to apply the pressure. The Central Coaster eventually ran out a comfortable winner, 31 shots to 25. On a neighbouring rink, Kel Pitt gave his supporters something to cheer about when he clinched third place with a nail-biting 31-30 win. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News.